Hello, friends, and welcome to Miss Shelved, your bi-weekly dose of bookstore love. I'm your host, Nicole Brinkley, here with another fantastical episode. For those of you who are new to the podcast, welcome. Every two weeks, I introduce you to an independent bookseller in conversation with an author they love. This week's bookseller is Erica Watkins. Hi, I'm Erica Watkins, and I work at Green Apple Books on the Park in San Francisco, California. One of Erica's coworkers actually pitched me this podcast idea, and I couldn't be more delighted to have listened to this conversation. I know you're going to enjoy it too, because Erica's author partner is the legendary Tracy Dion. Hi, I'm Tracy Dion, author of Legendborn. Settle in as these two talk about Black representation in fantasy literature and what sorts of Black magical characters they want to see. Great. Tracy, firstly, I would love to give you my compliments to Legendborn. <laughs> um, so the way I even got to Michelle and Nicole was through my coworker, Casey, who listened to Michelle already and really liked it. And we had both at that point already read Legendborn and fangirled and had our conversations about how much we loved it. And she said, yo, what if we could pitch talking to Tracy Dion to the host of Michelle. And I thought it was a great idea. And now we're here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love hearing that story. I also love it when people use the word fangirl when they talk about their response to Legendborn because I'm such a <laughs> fangirl myself and fandom is such a big part of my life and my storytelling lineage. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think what I love the most about Legendborn is that it just seems to have the perfect balance of everything. You know, you have this amazing Black heroine, but she's not unreachable in a lot of ways that some fantasy heroines are. And then this wonderful world of lore that she's thrown into and that she handles amazingly well considering the circumstances <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah i i really wanted that i think for myself i mean i tell people sometimes that legendborn is sort of the story i needed to hear myself and so i was sort of swimming in the I would say the desires and vibes and emotional arc of the book before words were ever really written. I just knew how I wanted it to feel. I knew what I wanted to feel like. So I'm glad that you're picking up on all that. I love hearing that. I feel like that's a little bit rare, but also part of the writing process when you kind of start with this unsculpted block and then you hone in on it. But with Brie feeling like a very real person to me, I would definitely say that she is different from the fantasy trope of chosen ones being perfect in a lot of ways and kind of already mm -hmm. knowing what to do when they encounter their new world. And I think that's one trope that I tend to, I don't hate it. You know, I've definitely enjoyed stories with that trope, but it sometimes feels so unrealistic, especially for a teen character, because they have school and parents until they don't, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's very classic YA. Um, you know, it's interesting. I really wrote Legendborn not thinking of Brie as a chosen one. And there are certain kind of comments I think that you hear as an author where you're like, oh, people are really picking this up. I didn't realize that I was doing that or I thought about it so differently before people read it. But yeah, I really thought of her as you know, if you read the book, she interacts with the character Nick Davis, and I feel like we get the perspective of Chosen One in a couple different ways. Nick has an experience that you learn more and more about as the book goes on that, you know, makes it seem like he knows what the Chosen One experience is. And then you have Bree, who is really electing herself almost the Chosen One. It's like a self-assigned quest that she goes on and that she chooses herself as the person who's going to save the day and go on this mystery adventure. So I do think it's fun to play with what it means to be chosen, who does the choosing, you know, is the choice accurate? Like all that stuff, I think it's, you know, played with in Legendborn. Absolutely. I love that she chooses herself. <laughs> That's another yeah, really I've important message. 
Sure. I mean, you think about like the hero's journey, right? I was talking about this last weekend at an event that the, the hero's journey is so much about, you know, there's sort of classic, like there's an old mentor figure, usually a dude that bestows a quest, sort of like reveals a quest, assigns one to the hero. And I love this idea that there could be a black girl, a black teenage girl who figured that out, figured her quest out herself. And that also allows some flexibility in the story because as she learns more and gains more footing, she can adjust her quest to different goals, right? Like she has like one main goal, which is what happened to my mother. That's, you know, the summary on the back of the book. She's trying to figure out what happened to her mother, her mysterious death. But then Brie herself gets more information and sort of adjusts that and then it morphs into a different type of quest as the book goes on. Yeah, and I guess in contrast to everyone else that's a part of the legend-born society who don't really have a choice because they're born into their roles. And I feel like Nick probably wishes he could have chosen. Yeah, it's funny you're saying that because I'm thinking about how that plays out. Even in, I'm working on the sequel now, like how it plays out that they don't get to choose. And William is a character, I think he says that first, like, we don't get a choice in all of this. And that comes up a few different ways in the first book. And it's a theme I think I'm still playing with. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to also consider how Brie might not have gotten a choice if she had not been born Black. Mm -hmm. And the way that her Black ancestors protected her from that and gave her that power. Yeah. I always try and figure out where I am on spoilers on, on Legendborn. But, you know, if you're aware of what we mean by that, <laughs> then, <laughs> yeah. Um, then yeah, you know, the magic in Legendborn, it's really using one core element, but we have different systems around it. And the system of rootcraft that's inspired by real world root work includes protection. And that's very much a theme of root work as a practice in the here and now, and this idea that protection could also mean, you know, not being forced into something, I think is really, really interesting, particularly when you think about the history of enslavement and a sort of folk magic system, a folk practice that might come out of that would be something that protects people from being forced into doing anything, right? Right. And Actually, related to that, I have a question about your choices for the types of magic in the story. What motivated you to create one system that was more rooted in African-American tradition and then one system that seems to be a little more fueled by colonialism? Sure. Yeah. You know, before I get into that, I think we could talk a little bit about the structure overall of Legendborn. So Legendborn is a story, as we've mentioned, about a 16-year-old girl named Brie who is assigning herself a quest to figure out what happened to her mother. Her mother's died um, and she thought it was an accident, but then she gets some information at, pretty much at the start of the book that maybe there's more to what was on the police report. And she decides to infiltrate a secret society at UNC Chapel Hill because she believes that they have some connection and that they have access to the truth of what really happened here. But along the way, she finds out that the secret society is descended from the Knights of the Round Table. They claim there's a magical war coming. Brie finds out that she has her own magic. And then it becomes sort of a back and forth for her about whether or not she's going to pursue her mission to find out what happened to her mother, whether she's going to get embroiled in this war, what her own magic was leading her to do and be. I knew that I wanted to have different philosophies of magic use in one book, because I've always found that really fascinating whenever I read fantasy books. And magic for a lot of BIPOC authors, Black authors, when they write fantasy, I believe a lot of us uh, as a community of, of writers and storytellers are really talking about power. So it's like magic is essentially a discussion about power in so many of these stories. And so there's access to power and power is sort of a neutral resource. It's an element in the air in this book. And people call it different things and people have full philosophies about how it's best used. And I really like the idea of the Arthurian secret society having more of a colonialist view on resources. You know, 
Arthuriana is uh, a type of fandom and lore narrative shared community that's been going on for 1500 years all over the world, but it originated in Western Europe. And the way that it gets shaped and displayed and played with most commonly in the collective imagination is very much Western Europe. So it made sense to me that if there was a society that was descended from that area of the world, that they had come over to America and the East Coast in particular in a colonialist sort of way, it would make sense that they would think of a resource as something that should be taken and used and could be taken and used. And they've done that successfully. But then I would love the idea of coming up against another group of individuals who would see it as a shared resource, even with the dead, even with the people who had used it before in this world supernatural beings in the dead have access to the have the most close access to this magic resource and so rather than using it for their own designs they borrow it from the people who can use it most frequently which are their ancestors and i just think this idea of borrow versus taking you know sharing versus stealing that's really the stuff that i ended up wanting to play with and it mapped really nicely onto the history that I wanted to explore, which is both, you know, colonial history in North Carolina and in the East Coast and the United States more broadly, but also enslavement and how all that's connected. Wow, I love how layered that is. And I really admire the way you were able to put it all together, because then it gives your fantasy even more of a historical fiction bent almost. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I did so much research for Legend War, and that was very much like historical fiction and nonfiction research. Um, <laughs> I had nine subject matter experts, consultants, and research readers, sensitivity and authenticity readers for Legend Born. I come from an academic background, and so for me, that seems like the best way to create a story like this in particular. I don't know that every book I write will require that much research underpinning it, but Legendborn certainly did. Is that much research so far happening for Bloodmarked? Um, yes and no. You know, a lot of what I needed to do for the universe was like research that was done already, that has been done already for Legendborn. So I'm drawing on a lot of my resources from book one. And Bloodmarked, the sequel, is a different type of journey. And I am using consultants right now. I have five, not nine. So <laughs> my list is like a little smaller, um, but I actually think it'll probably go up to maybe six by the time I'm done just with how I operate. But three or four people are coming back on board from my team from Legendborn, including like a Welsh consultant in Medievalist. He's back, a Civil War and uh, Atlantic slave trade and, um, and campus historians coming back. I have a, a little crew that I hope sticks with me for the series, but there are a couple new voices in the mix, and I feel like it'll be spoiling if I say what their specialties are. Of course. <laughs> That's great, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm definitely in, moving in like a very different direction um, in terms of the new sort of magical world that we're exploring in the second book because of course you have to expand and go to new places so do you think there are other fantasy tropes that you would want to put your own spin on oh sure i mean like i said chosen one for me i think it's played with in legendborn but i don't think i've fully executed like the prophecy mm -hmm. you know that sort yeah. of like prophecy chosen one i feel like that would be really interesting for me to play with and I think it would be really cool to do a story that involves like a magical familiar you know there's stories that have an animal familiar or some sort or some other bonded creature that you work with I'm thinking here of like of course Amber Caffrey classic with the dragons and this idea that you could have some magical creature that's your buddy for adventures I, I feel like that's just some stuff that I was living in and playing with as a kid, but now I think I could do some really cool stuff with. I still want to write a vampire story. That's fantasy, but it's very specific paranormal fantasy with their own set of tropes. So that's probably on my horizon one day, but I, I want to make sure that it's really unique the way that I approach it. I think I would love to see you write a vampire story. <laughs> uh, thank you. The vote of confidence. Uh, the, the few times I've talked about it, people have been like, yes, what are you going to do with it? And I'm like, I'm going to, 
I gotta let it brew. I gotta like think about it a little bit. I can't do anything that I've seen before. That's my rule. So it'll be something really new and fresh or else I'll get bored writing it. So <laughs> I probably always wanted to see black fairies as a kid growing mm-hmm. up because fairies were my introduction to fantasy really. Um, oh, my favorite and first fairy series that I read is Wicked Lovely by Melissa Marr. What's that about? I don't think I've heard of it. She takes the approach of having this main character who is afraid of fairies because she's been taught through lore and her family that they are harmful to humans. However, though, she has what they call the sight. She can see the fairies and she's been taught to constantly hide herself from them, make sure that she never draws their attention, except for this one fairy king who is in her small town because he moves his court all over the place. He's been searching Mm. for his queen forever and he thinks it's her. Oh my God, I love this. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, and so she has to be faced with this decision of like, do I give up my life and become a fairy for this guy that just showed up out of nowhere? <laughs> or do my I... answer is yes. <laughs> See, that was like, my immediately. Too. <laughs> yes, you do. Go. <laughs> <laughs> but I probably would have loved that story even more if there had been, you know, pe- POC fairies involved. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. And I also did not grow up loving Twilight, but that might have changed my mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I um Twilight is so interesting. I, I, I can't help but think about the phenomena of Twilight when I think about Twilight, right? Like yeah. I don't really know how to think about the story narratively on its own sort of legs. I always think about the cultural phenomena around it at the same time. Um, it'd be really interesting to somehow go back to like what was interesting, what was compelling there and see how we can take that out and also incorporate the realities of, of race. If you're going to have a contemporary fantasy story, which is what Twilight is, you know? Yeah. What's your favorite or really impactful story that's really in the world of a lot of already established lore that does a good job of creating its own lore? I thought about this question and I I feel like my answer is not going to be a book. And I also feel like I'm going to preface this by saying that I don't even really know fully the depths of lore that I am witnessing when I watch this television show but avatar the last airbender full stop it's some of the best storytelling i've ever experienced period in any medium at all (laughs) it's Uh. incredible it's a feat really it's it's something really special but what i love about it is like you know i i know enough to know that this idea of reincarnation as having a spiritual leader as a reincarnated like that's something that comes from certain parts of Asian culture, East Asian culture. I'm thinking about the Dalai Lama here specifically, right? And I know enough to know that the writers, the showrunners, the creators of Avatar did a lot of homework. And so I'd love to have them unpack particular episodes where they drew on lore and where they spun it um, and how they spun it. And you know, I'd love to one day just get into a, a deep dive with writers who know more about the cultures that they drew from than I do, because the sense that I've always gotten is that we're experiencing something and there's a kernel of historical, mythological reality that we're looking at, but they've taken it and made it into something new. Yeah, I totally agree. I also really love Avatar. I actually saw it for the first time once it hit Netflix and I really loved it in the way that I think for me, fantasy has evolved from something that felt like fiction and make believe into something that was actually really real as I explored different forms of spirituality for myself. And that's what I was saying about your story being so rooted in its original influence. 
because I get a little picky <laughs> with fantasy now that I know <laughs> so much more about spirituality and mythology and how they inform each other. I get a little picky when authors take that creative license, even though I, I understand that it definitely will add to the story and give you a new perspective. But sometimes I feel like it's not done as well. And mm -hmm. I love that you didn't seem to have to take that kind of liberty to make your story work really well. Mm, thank you. That's a really wonderful compliment. Um, I mean, I, I, I tried to be really respectful of the living material that I was working with. Also make it very clear, like I think in my author's note, one of the things I said was like, this root work is a living folk cultural practice. The magic system in my book is not root work. Like this is not an educational nonfiction text. <laughs> um, here are the things that I drew from and I can name them. These are the elements, these are the specific list of things that I drew from. Here's why I called it what I did. Here are the things that it's not. And I think being really clear about that is good. And also being really specific, like I'm describing a practice and we're still only seeing a little sliver of how it's practiced in Legendborn. I hope that I've communicated that there's more to it than what Brie learns. And that is a little bit of a safety for me as a writer, because now I'm saying this is not all encompassing, even though I have a disclaimer that it's also not, you know, it's not the real world. It's just it draws from the real world. I think it's really important to allow for, you know, to not make claims as though what you're drawing on or how you've done it, you know, is enough to be able to make a statement about the real world in full. Like I'm not talking about all of root work here. You can't even because it changes from family member to family member sometimes. It's like a careful line to walk. So it means a lot if you think that I've done that well. I, I really do. I think too that there's growing representation for more African mythology. And I love that. My favorite story that's steeped in that lore would probably have to be the Tristan Strong series mm. because it introduced me to this whole world of folklore and culture that I didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the bottle tree, like there's yes. so much it's like gum baby. Yeah, I love that. I love that it, it, it's so steeped in particularly Black American lore and the types of social, cultural practices and mythologies that were developed in Black American history is really interesting. They're really interesting. They're really compelling, really powerful considering the context. I love that Tristan's playing in that same world. And the way that Kwame Mbalia allows him to still have a very childlike adventure, I think mm -hmm. it's, I feel like personally, I wouldn't know what to do with that because it would be easier to write that for a teenager. Mm -hmm. That's just the way I see it because that's my experience that I would probably connect more with. Yeah, you know, I am so admiring of middle grade authors. <laughs> I tried to write middle grade one time last year, just like, just to see, and the voice just edged up <laughs> by the end of the short story. <laughs> and it was like, um, <laughs> they just like kept aging. I was like every page they turned six months older. By the end, they were just 16. <laughs> so I, I really am impressed with authors who really, who nail that voice and live there. I think YA is my home voice naturally and a little bit upper YA, I think is where my voice usually as a writer is sitting. So I just, Kwame is amazing. He knows when to slip in a great dad joke. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, he just knows when to really be so silly, how to describe voices. And even when he reads his own work, you can hear the liveliness in it. And ah, it's amazing. That's a gift. Yes. Um, what's your favorite adult fantasy? Ooh, good question. I'm going to say a couple things. So one, I still, from a craft perspective, I still really, really, really adore Uprooted by Naomi Novik. There's just paragraphs in that book that are remarkable that I go back to just from a writing perspective. But I think the first adult fantasy that comes to mind is something that I just deeply, deeply loved was 
Melanie Ron wrote this trilogy. It's not finished. I feel bad putting her on blast, but um, gosh, like 20 years ago. And it's a trilogy about, I think it was meant to be a trilogy about three sisters. And it's a second world fantasy. And the whole world is matriarchal. And it's called the Exiles Trilogy. And what I loved about the Exiles Trilogy as a young reader is that I didn't really know that we were in a matriarchal society until we got to like certain scenes. And I realized that certain figures like the police officers in the world and like other figures were women. And I just remember really loving how she handled magic, how there was a story of three different sisters who were navigating the society differently, how she handled romance as these three different sisters. One of them goes evil, sort of spoiler. So like really old school in some ways, classic adult fantasy where you have multiple POVs, there are multiple magical approaches and styles. There's political intrigue, court intrigue. I was really into that as a young, young kiddo and there's a third book and it never got published. And I remember desperately being like, how do I write to her and just tell her, please do this book. Now that I'm an author, I'm like, leave that lady alone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, she's fine. Like if it comes out, it comes out. If not, then it, we were very lucky to have those first two books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uprooted has actually been on my to read list for a long time. Yeah. I mean, I know there's some lore there from Eastern Europe that I am not fully versed in, but I know that Novik has talked about that. I also really love that there's this spin in the, that's on the back of the book. It's not a spoiler that there's a dragon that comes to take a maiden, which is a very old sort of fantasy trope. But in this case, the dragon is a wizard. It's a man. And this man who's called the dragon <laughs> comes to take a maiden like once a year. I just, I love that little tiny twist that, it is a dragon, but it's not. It's a really interesting read. I love it. Oh, I was also going to ask you if you've read The Dark Fantastic by Ebony Elizabeth Thomas. I have not read the whole book. I own the whole book and I have read chapters of it. And okay. it's a feat. It's wonderful. Yes. And I've also spent time talking with Ebony. We've spoken about Legendborn. We've spoken about her work. And I just think it's an incredible resource. And we're very, very fortunate to have her writing about these topics in our lives right now, as we're seeing a, a, a growth in particularly Black uh, American fantasy and Black fantasy with girls at the helm. I just think it's it's a great text. Like she talks about Bonnie from The Vampire Diaries, <laughs> and that just spoke to my soul. <laughs> <laughs> I think some parts of Legendborn are like me trying to reclaim what I wanted for Bonnie in the Vampire oh, Diaries, wow. like a black witch. Like there's part of me that's just like, it could have been her show. <laughs> yes. I didn't see the Vampire Diaries, but I just started the Dark Fantastic and was considering it in reference to Legendborn, especially with her chapter on Guinevere from Merlin. But I think for me, the chapter that's really got me going was the Hunger Games chapter and the way mm. she sort of really reframes your idea and perception of Rue's role in the story as this sacrifice because she argues that Rue is the Mockingjay and not Katniss. Oh, wow. I haven't read this chapter and that's brilliant. I'm looking at so it on my good. bookshelf right now. Uh, I love that. And then with the Merlin chapter, she, she gives language to this pattern of, not even sure what to call it, like this pattern of perception, I guess, or, or even reaction that happens when Black characters are introduced into traditionally white settings. And mm -hmm. she calls it spectacle, hesitation, violence, and haunting in that every Black character sort of goes through that cycle until they don't. And Guinevere and certainly Brie from Legendborn don't mm -hmm. do that. Um, and I just, that was amazing the way she broke that down. She's so smart. <laughs> and I almost wonder if there's an opportunity to have like a round table about that book. Because I know what she's talking about and the wounds that get created from these depictions I'm not the only person who's saying I'm trying to 
you know, reclaim what happened to, to Bonnie and the Vampire Diaries. I'm not the only person who has a wound from a character that we saw ourselves in that didn't go where we hoped it could go and in fact hurt us and did a sort of harm, like a like a, a spiritual harm and maybe even a creative harm when we saw how that character was treated in media or books. And I just, I think she's doing something really restorative, particularly for Black girls and women. Yeah, I really agree. One more thing that she said in the Hunger Games chapter was that when she saw the movies, she was surprised that everyone was white because she felt like the circumstances that the characters are in would not apply to white people in the real world. Mm. And she was really taken aback by that. Wow. Yeah. And then on the flip side, there are all these people who were mad that Rue was Black because they didn't expect her to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you felt like you've seen any other creators approach introducing Black characters into white settings and just handling that really well? Yeah, I think... A lot of creators are doing that type of work. I, I don't know how many people are like really trying to look at that from every single angle as part of the main, you know, engine of the book. I don't think it's the main engine of Legendborn. I think that it's part of the antagonistic environment that I wanted to layer in to Bree's journey. I think that shows up in uh, A Song Below Water by Bethany C. Morrow. I think it shows up in Ace of Spades that just came out. And I think it shows up in ways in The Bells that came out several years ago, Danielle Clayton. I mean, I just think that lots of authors are touching on this. In my case, I wanted to do it very specifically in an academic institutional environment, which I think is something that not everybody's doing. A Song Below Water does that, and then it also does more than that. But that's a specific type of developmental violence, I would say, when you have characters who are surrounded by people who aren't like them, don't look like them, don't treat them the same, and also in a physical space that was built for white people, but not black people. So I think like even more than that, it's like a very specific interrogation about the academy that I'm doing as well. Yeah. And I think that's really important. I'd honestly love to see that done in a middle grade novel because mm -hmm. there's a lot going on with children of color in that age group that mm -hmm. probably needs a lot more visibility. Yeah, I think that Danielle's book, The Marvelers, the middle grade, I want to say it's coming out next year, but I always get dates wrong. Um, please look it up on Goodreads. <laughs> but The Marvelers, I want to say that that's going to touch on those things that she's not looking away from from that conversation. In this case, it's a it's a magical school environment. We love a magical yeah. school. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like we're reaching our end point. Tracy, where can everybody find you on social media? I am found at, at Tracy Dion, T-R-A-C-Y-D-E-O-N-N, -N, everywhere. That's Instagram and Twitter and at TracyDion.com. You can find me at on Instagram at Erica the Luminary. That's Erica with a C. And thank you to everyone that's listening. And thank you, Tracy, for sharing your time with me. And then thank you for Legendborn. <laughs> oh, thank you for, for having me, for saying that. And yes, absolutely. Thank you for everyone who's bought Legendborn, borrowed it, sh shared it, gifted it gotten it from a library, gotten it from an indie bookstore, and is listening to this now. I appreciate all of you. And we close the chapter on another episode. If you liked it, and we hope you do, don't forget to subscribe and follow us wherever you get your podcasts. Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, we're on them all. If you really like what we do, you can support us by following on Instagram and Twitter at MissShelvedPod. Early access to episodes, as well as lots of other cool perks, are available over at my Patreon. That's patreon.com slash N-E Brinkley. We'll be back with another episode for you in two weeks. Until then, happy reading! <laughs>